Let's be honest, $100 doesn't get you much anymore. A Raspberry Pi, extra guac and Chipotle, those cool cufflinks that your wife's boyfriend always wears. It's honestly ridiculous. However, I'm gonna be your saving grace today. I'm gonna show you that with just $100, you can get yourself a nice, new, powerful home server. Now the price is fairly arbitrary here. I just picked $100 because it sounds good and I think it's about the cheapest I'd go without getting too jank. If your budget is more than, by all means, spend more. If it's less than, that's okay too. We'll talk about that. So other than setting a $100 limit for myself, I also set a few rules. Rule number one, no local deals. I set this rule because I wanted this to be something anyone could replicate for the most part. Fully aware that I could have found some better deals on Craigslist and with my talents, probably could have even gotten some stuff for free. So everything I bought was off of eBay. Rule two, no pre-builds, kind of. There had to be some kind of thought to this and I figured it would be lame to just buy the best $100 listing I could find. Now I'm not saying that's a bad idea, I'm just saying it was more fun to do it this way. Rule number three, the three threes. We need a minimum of PCI 3.0, SATA 3, and DDR3. Rule number four, power efficiency. I set a goal of a sub 50 watt system, so no dual socket systems that eat up over 100 watts. And finally, rule number five, expandability. The system needs to support expansion in terms of PCIe cards or storage, which essentially just rules out mini PCs. All right, so with those rules in mind, I set off on my virtual journey. My idea was to just search for PC computers on eBay and set a max price of $50, which would give us half the budget to spend on upgrades. I found more listings than I thought I would here, but a lot of them would break rule five since they were mini PCs with no room for expansion. The ones that were upgradable though seemed to be quite old, which had me worried about the power requirements. After about 30 minutes of searching, I stumbled upon a listing that seemed to check all the boxes. An HP ProDesk with an i5-6500 and eight gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, but with no storage. $50 even or best offer. I went ahead and put in an offer of $38 and the seller countered with $45, so I jumped on it. The i5-6500 is decent enough with four cores and four threads, boosts up to 3.6 gigahertz, has integrated graphics, supports virtualization, and has a TDP of 65 watts, which is above our 50 watt target, but the system isn't gonna be running full blast, so I think we're safe. We also get a decent amount of PCIe slots, a pretty decent case, and the best part, a CD drive. With tax and shipping, it came out to $48.26, giving us just over $50 left. Since the system has no storage, we obviously needed some. I went into this with the idea that I'd like this to be able to function as a NAS, and I ain't running no NAS without some kind of redundancy, which will require two drives. I set a minimum of two terabytes of storage for myself, which would be a minimum of two two terabyte drives. After doing some browsing, I ended up going with two three terabyte drives for a total cost of $46.78. Looking back, I think I made a mistake here because I could have gotten two two terabyte drives for just $30. This would have left me with around $20 left instead of $4.96. What even am I supposed to do with that? I figured there were two options here, cheap SSD or cheap NIT. I eventually settled on a 60 gigabyte SSD because the thought of having to run an operating system on spinning drives made me cry. This ended up costing me $7.48, bringing the grand total to $102.52. Yeah, I went $2 over, go mow the world's smallest lawn or something. And here it is, the fruits of all of our labor. We've got an i5, 6,500, eight gigabytes of RAM, two three terabyte hard drives, and a 60 gigabyte SSD. I mentioned before that I probably should have gone with two two terabyte drives to sacrifice some of the storage, which may have given me enough for a 2.5 gigabit NIC. Oh well, this is what I ended up with and I'm not mad about it. When everything came in, I was pretty happy with the system. It actually looks pretty nice and it was super clean, which was surprising. The case fortunately has just enough mounting spots for our two hard drives and one SSD. Unfortunately though, 
It doesn't come with the mounting brackets or screws. That's okay. I just grabbed my random assortment of screws and washer kit and MacGyvered it. Hey man, if it's stupid, but it works, it ain't stupid. So that's our hardware, but what about software? What do we run on here? I would usually go with Proxmox or TrueNAS, but I don't think we have enough resources for Proxmox to be worth it. And I'm not running ZFS, so TrueNAS is out. I know Proxmox isn't resource heavy or anything, but I feel that it's more suited for systems with a decent amount of resources, since you'll most likely be spinning up VMs and containers for application and storage management. It would certainly be fine on here, but I went with a different route. With hardware like this, I narrowed it down to two choices, Unraid or Open Media Vault. I like Unraid since it's a great all-in-one solution for hosting an ass as well as virtualization with Docker. Same goes for Open Media Vault, but even more so focused on being a NAS first with some virtualization. In the end, I settled on Unraid and yes, I know it isn't free. I only went with it because I've used Open Media Vault in one of my last videos and haven't done an Unraid video in probably two years. so. I wanted to give it some loving. Now everything in here is pretty much how I remember it. If you want to see my initial thoughts on Unraid from like forever ago, go check that video out. I'm not going to do a deep dive into Unraid here as I'm working on a dedicated video for that. Subscribe if that tickles your pickle. My first task was to set up my array, which would be pretty freaking easy since I have only two hard drives. One of them was a parity drive and one of them was a data drive. The way Unraid works is that you can add whatever size drives you want to your array, but each drive can only use as much capacity as your parity drive. In my case, that's three terabytes. So I can throw in a one terabyte, two terabyte, or three terabyte drives to expand my storage. But if I were to use anything larger, like a 10 terabyte drive, it would only give me three terabytes worth of capacity. It's still an awesome feature of Unraid and helps keep older mismatched drives from becoming landfill. But wait, what about your 60 gigabyte SSD? Now that's not being used since Unraid boots from a USB drive, then runs directly in RAM. So our SSD is going to be used as a cache drive. I just created a new cache pool, then assigned my SSD to that, and boom, we have caching. Now I had two goals with this server, to use as a NAS and to run applications. To check that first box, we simply had to create a share and export it, which essentially means just to allow it to be accessible over the network via SMB. Transferring files went about as expected. We maxed out the one gigabit connection, writing to our three terabyte array. I don't know how fast these older drives would actually go, especially while doing parity calculations, so maybe going for that 2.5 gigabit NIC wouldn't really have been as much of a benefit as I thought. Either way, it works as expected, and I can't complain about that. All right, applications. I'd argue the second biggest selling point of Unraid is the large app store that has a good mix of official apps and community backed projects. These run on top of Docker, which is already installed by default. Most apps are single click installs with some requiring a bit more setup with environment variables. Now with a setup like this, you'll never please everyone. Sure, it's a simple process, which a lot of beginners like, but I can see advanced users turning up their nose at the thought of using a simple UI for container management. To those people, I'd say stop sniffing your own farts and go touch some grass. With that, I was free to install whatever apps I wanted, and to really test the system out, I installed a lot of apps. You can see we are running quite a few things here, and while they're running, even though they are idle for the most part, we aren't using much of our horsepower. Obviously, once we start using some of these things, that will change, but this just shows you that you can run a whole lot of stuff on cheaper hardware as long as you aren't running all that stuff at full tilt all the time. Let's see what we can get out of here though. I'm gonna load up a Minecraft game and connect to my server while also running Plex. As you can see, when I do this, we are definitely using our horsepower now and using more than our 50 watt benchmark. Note that I am transcoding via Plex since this is playing remotely over cellular data but even still, this system is usable and Minecraft is running fine. This may change when more users connect though, so be weary of that. If I switch to local Plex playback, which doesn't require real-time transcoding, we are using much less of our resources. Seeing these results has me coming to the conclusion that this is an excellent system for a single user or to run media services locally. If you're looking to host a Plex server for a bunch of people that will require transcoding, then 
you may want something with a bit more juice. Now in terms of running VMs, um, that didn't go well at all. It was extremely slow and even when just trying to install Ubuntu desktop with no other services running, it was having issues. It froze up during install at different points each time. I didn't really expect to be spinning up VMs on this thing as I'd honestly just use it as a main Docker server anyway, so it wasn't really that big of a deal. But man, I was hoping to at least be able to spin up a single Linux VM without it pooping its pants. With all of that said, what do I think of this system? It's freaking awesome, man. It's $100, so clearly you have to make some trade-offs. Would I love more RAM? Yeah. Would I like more processing power? Duh. More capacity? Faster networking? A GPU? Yeah, man, all that sounds really nice, but we only have $100. I said before, if I could do it over again, I'd probably take a bit less storage capacity and go with a 2.5 gigabit NIC or a 4x1 gigabit NIC, which would allow me to virtualize a firewall on here. Again, it's all about what you're looking for, but overall, I think this is a solid system. If I had about $50 more, I'd 100% snag a dedicated GPU for Plex transcoding or more RAM or storage. Let me know down in the comments what you do with your $100 build and what you do differently here. Now, if you have less than $100, that is okay. You don't have to go on eBay and find all these parts separately. Go search Craigslist, go search Facebook Marketplace. There are a lot of systems out there that you can get already built with pretty much everything you need for a fraction of the cost. But that's all I have for you today. If you like this, then go ahead and drop a like if you want to see more stuff like this or want to see my follow-up video on revisiting Unraid, then subscribe so you'll be around for that. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are literally my $100 support group and I give you kisses, all of you virtually. You guys are awesome. And if you're still watching, you're awesome too. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next one.